you have your Bibles with you today, either print or electronic, I invite you to turn in them to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Hear now the word of the Lord. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him concerning the events that will happen soon. An angel was sent to God's servant John, so that John could share the revelation with God's other servants. John faithfully reported the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, everything he saw. God blesses the one who reads this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to it and obey what it says. For the time is near when these things will happen. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace from the one who was, who is, and always will be. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the commander of all the rulers of the world. All praise to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us his kingdom and his priests, who serve before God his Father. Give to him everlasting glory. He rules forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the nations of the earth will weep because of him. Yes, and amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who, who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. The Word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we, your people, come to you with a longing for the hope of the gospel in a hopeless world. Open our hearts and minds today to receive your eternal word afresh and anew so we may know the joy of our salvation. In Christ's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Well, over the course of my ministry, I have had several opportunities to study the book of Revelation with the congregations to which I've been appointed. The announcement of such studies have always brought mixed reactions. From some I hear, I don't really want to study Revelation because it's too hard to understand. From others I hear, why should we study Revelation? We won't be here during what it's telling us about anyway, so what's the point? The reason for these responses and others is really because of a fundamental misunderstanding of the book of Revelation. Revelation is most popularly interpreted to be a prediction of the future and the events that will come and unfold at the end of time. That interpretation is a view that was advanced in the 19th century preacher's work, John Nelson Darby, who developed the notion of dispensationalism as a way of predicting the actual second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, this kind of teaching has also been popularized in the writings of Hal Lindsey many years ago and in the popular book series Left Behind by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins, as well as others who write in their vein. And while this interpretation has its place and there is merit in it, it leads a bit to apathy, it leads a bit to some laziness in the midst of the suffering of the world because we see the suffering and we go, well, that's just signs of the times. That just means that Jesus is coming soon. And we don't attempt to really live out the resurrection life that God has called us to and the life that he's called us to of working to alleviate the suffering of this world by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and by physically caring for those who are in need. And what Revelation tends to get boiled down to is a bunch of mathematical equations and calculations and interpretive speculation rather than what it was intended to be. 
You see, the book of Revelation has much more to offer us as we live out our lives as resurrection people than just a series of events that will happen far off in the future when God has simply had enough of the debauchery of the world and said, now's the time I'm going to bring the hammer down. I mean, that's a lot of the ways that we've studied Revelation and come to understand it is God's judgment on the world, but we won't be here, so who cares? You know, the rapture's going to come, we're going to be gone, and then all those bad people that didn't believe in Jesus, man, God's going to really hammer them. And you know what? There's a little bit of joy in knowing that at times. We go, you know, uh, they're going to get theirs. But Revelation has more to offer. So if Revelation isn't primarily a textbook of the end of the world, how should we look at this strange text in our time? Well, we find the answer to our question in the very first verse where we find the title of the book. The true title of the book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the word revelation is a translation of the Greek word apocalypsis, which means an unveiling. Now, see, when we think of apocalypse or apocalyptic things, we're thinking of end times, end of the world. You know, the devil's going to get his. What that word really does mean is an unveiling. This is the idea of taking the cover off of a piece of art so that everyone can clearly see what the object is. That's a little bit different. It's a little bit different than mathematic equations and trying to decide if those big locusts are Black Hawk helicopters or not, right? I mean, that's a big difference. And so Revelation, then, is the unveiling of Jesus Christ of the will and plans of God for his people. To say the book of Revelation is an unveiling of Jesus Christ brings to us two powerful implications. And the first is this. Our Lord wanted us to know and understand his plans for us as his people and for all the earth. That's the first thing. He wanted us to understand. You go, well, then why do you use such crazy language? Well, sometimes it takes figurative language to get past our rational minds and into our hearts. For me, this is great news that Jesus wanted us to know the mystery of the ages, that he wanted to reveal it to us as his people. The New Living Translation, which I read for you, tells us an angel was sent to God's servant John so John could share the revelation with God's servants. John was given this wonderful unveiling for himself, but not for himself alone, nor for the high-minded scholars alone, but for everyone who believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we will know God's plan for us and for the whole earth. That's the point. Further evidence for our Lord's desire for us to know his will and his plan is also found in this first verse when it says, John could share the revelation. Now, the word share here in the New Living Translation or signified in the King James Version carries the meaning of, to use symbols for the purpose of revealing, explaining, or interpreting something that was before unclear. Kind of like my picture of the chicken hiding in its egg to try to help the kids picture what it means to sit in fear, rather to go out in the strength of the Lord. Pictures, images, symbols. Our Lord wants us to understand this wonderful book and does expect that we will understand the symbols and vivid imagery in Revelation at least as much as we are able to. So we should take heart when we come to some of the more difficult word pictures in Revelation that God through his Holy Spirit can indeed make these symbols clear to those who approach them in true faith. Now, the second implication comes to us in verse 3 when we read, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. That means I'm going to be blessed because I just read part of it to you. And I'm going to read more of it to you in the coming weeks. 
Oh, but not just me. Wait a minute. And all who listen to its message and obey what it says. So you, according to Revelation, will be blessed by listening to the message of Revelation. But there's, there's another piece to that we got to make sure we understand. All who listen to its message are blessed and those people who are listening obey what it says. You see, as we are obedient to the Word of God, there is blessing. Blessing comes to all who read and hear the words of this book. Is there any greater reason for Christians to read and study this unveiling of Christ than the blessings we'll receive? When we read and let us not forget, obey, and keep the words of this book, we will receive blessing. The idea of blessing is the idea of God giving us great joy. The joy of God brings hope to the troubled heart who looks around at the world and at the the world's attacks on the family and on faith and says no matter what happens in this life, there is joy in knowing our Lord and knowing that He is in control and He has a plan to make all things new and perfect in His time. Now notice it's in His time, it's not in our time. You know, at the end of Revelation, John says, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. He's like, hurry up, Jesus, come. Make these things happen so that we can know the fullness of the blessing. And, and sometimes that's us too. We say, Lord, can you just speed up a little bit? I know you said you'd bless me. I, I know that you said you answer our prayers, but you're not really doing this at the speed that I want you to do it in, right? Give me a little bit more of the picture, Lord. I, I, I need to see what's coming next. I need to see the, the next time, like at the end of TV shows sometimes. That's what I need. But he says it's in my time, not in your time. When everything is set, when everything is exactly as it needs to be, God acts. And that's true when it comes to the prophecies that we find in the book of Revelation, and that's true when it comes to each area of our lives. In his time, he will meet our needs. In his time, he will pour out blessing. In his time, He will answer our prayers. In His time, we will understand the will and the way of God. You see, in all, Revelation is a proclamation of hope. The text of Revelation calls this book a book of prophecy. And when the Bible talks about prophecy, it is talking about both a foretelling and a forthtelling. In other words, prophecy is is not simply a road map of future events. It is that prophecy tells us about what will happen in the future that God has laid out for us. But prophecy is also a proclamation of God's will, His plans, His care, and His comfort for His people. It can also be a foretelling and a warning of coming judgment on those who refuse by their lack of acceptance of Jesus Christ to be God's people, thus placing themselves under the direction of the devil because there's only two ways you can go in this life. Either you're going to follow the Lord or you're going to follow the devil. And there is a default position because we are fallen humanity. And our default position is not to follow the Lord because we are fallen, we are sinful human beings. But yet God in His love, in His power, in His authority brought His Son into this world to die on the cross for us to make a way for us to choose Him. Because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to be in the default position of lost and going to hell. We can instead be in the glorious position of having our sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and experiencing His resurrection power in our lives that lead to eternal life. That's the good news, is it not? And so the book of Revelation helps us to see the fullness of all of this as we accept Him. And it's important for us to understand this prophecy because it is for God's people in all ages. It was for God's people in the time that it was written. 
You know, John just didn't send this to the seven churches so they could go, well, this isn't important for us. We're not going to be here when this is happening. It had a meaning for them in their day. And it has a meaning for us in our day. In fact, throughout the entire church age, God has been delivering his message through this book. It went first to the struggling people of first century church, and it has been for each and every one of us down through the time that we've been knowing Christ. Therefore, we must understand no part of Revelation should simply be regulated to the future only or to be excluded as something that doesn't offer hope for us. But instead, we should understand that all of it, whether it's in the socio-political time in which it was written or whether it's in our time, has something to speak to us, not just to the seven churches of Revelation, but to all believers in all times. The church in John's day was involved in a deadly conflict. They were being attacked on every side by the society in which they lived. It would have been easy for them to think they were simply fighting a physical battle with the government and social powers around them. But Revelation will remind them that it is a spiritual battle that we fight. As Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against those mighty powers of darkness who rule this world, and against wicked spirits in the heavenly realms. All the struggles were not simply from the outside, though. Many of the struggles were on the inside as well. The people could have handled being attacked from the outside, right? We can always handle being attacked by the outside. But when the struggles are within the body itself, the inner pressures can destroy the church. Pressures of heresy they were dealing with, immorality and worldliness, distortions of the gospel, powerful false teachers, sexual enticement, the lure of cultural acceptance and financial success all weighed heavily on the people of John's day. All these pressures were tearing the church apart. And in truth, we are no different. You see, we have passed through the Christian century. We have passed through the Christian nations. And now we are living again in a post-Christian time. Our world today, our country today, our society today is much more like Rome in the time of John's writing than it is like the Christian world that we thought we once knew. And because of that, we are called to be alert. We too today in the church are dealing with devastating pressures within and without. Our society is working to stamp out all vestiges of Christianity from public life and replace it with political correctness, cultural Marxism, multiculturalism, and humanistic, heathenistic philosophy. That's the order of the day. In our churches, we struggle with false teaching from many of our leaders and not just simple matters of interpretation, but write out heresy on the part of some. We have been asked in the church to accept all kinds of immorality and embrace it as diversity. All of these pressures are leading our church into what our brother John Wesley feared would become of the Methodist people, a form of godliness without the power, and dare I say, a form of ungodliness without any understanding of the truth of the gospel. We, like the church of the first century, need to know there is hope. Hope is what Revelation's all about. For the hope of the world is Jesus, and Revelation is the unveiling of Jesus Christ and his plan and his will for we who believe and remain true to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Since Jesus is our hope of the world, Jesus is exactly what the first century readers and believers throughout all ages are given in this first chapter of Revelation. But who is this Jesus? Here in these first verses of the unveiling of Christ, we have 
the assurance, the assurance that the revelation is of God and from God. The revelation comes from the triune God in all of His fullness and in all the ways He manifests Himself to the people of His love. We read in these first four, in, in the, we read in verses four and five that the revelation comes from God the Father, the Eternal One, who is, always was, and who always will be, and from the sevenfold Spirit of God. And we find that this revelation is from Jesus Christ, and the focus is the great unveiling of Jesus. In light of this we find that Jesus is the very Word of God. He is the faithful witness for us. He is the one who gives us true and trustworthy testimony of the person, attributes, will, and eternal power of God. The one who has seen all that has happened, all that is happening, and all that will happen as if it was all present at once. Because when Jesus ascended to heaven, he was no longer bound by time and space. He lives outside of time, outside of space, and he sees it all at once. We have to see it as it comes at us. But he sees it before even it's happening here. He is the one who died, not for his sins, but for our sins and the sins of all who would believe upon his name. This knowledge should bring hope to us when we suffer. It brought hope to the church of John's day and it brings hope to us today because Christ does not ask his loved ones to go anywhere he's not already gone. He has already suffered for us. He has already dealt with betrayal. He's already dealt with loss. He's already dealt with the grave and gained victory over it. In verse 5 we are told as a result of Christ's victory over the grave, he is the first to rise from the dead. Notice he's the first. Now, but what does it mean, the first to rise from the dead? Certainly we see other scriptural references to people rising from the dead, right? Right? Elijah, Elisha, Peter, Paul, and Jesus himself, they all raised people from the dead. The difference between these two risings is that all the people that they rose in that time died again. But Jesus is alive, and he's alive forevermore, and he will never die again. And because he lives in victory over death, we now have that eternal resurrection within us. He lives in the glorified state, and because of that, we too will live in the glorified state. He is the pioneer. He is the guarantee of our resurrection for all those who live by his name and all who are saved by his grace what that means for us is that there will come a day when all who have believed on him even you and me will rise from the dead and we will live as a recipient of that eternal life all pain all sickness all sorrow will be gone forever because death has been destroyed in resurrection because of his glorious resurrection, Jesus is now the ruler of all the earth. It doesn't always look like it to us, but ultimately he is. Although there are earthly rulers who we must contend with, Christ is in control and will one day take the throne of all the universe. Then all the pretenders to the throne will be forever humbled. This was good news for those who were suffering under the terrible rule of of the emperor and it's good news for all Christians everywhere everywhere to know that no matter what our Lord will have the last word the authority of princes kings presidents governors and even bishops pale in comparison to the authority of Jesus Christ the truth is we have but one ruler and that is Jesus Christ, and he rules over us all, and he is above all those who claim authority in this world. And therefore, like the apostle Peter told the chief priests and leaders of Israel, we must obey God rather than any human authority. Oh, we have to obey human authorities in this life, but when they contradict God, when they're trying to get us to go against His Word, when they want us to do things and approve of things that do not line up 
with the truth of the word of God, then we must say with the apostle Peter, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The rulers of this earth will pass away and their memories will fade from history. But our Lord is the true king, the commander of all the rulers of this world, it says. You see, Jesus is the one who loves us and has made us a kingdom of priests to serve him. Our Lord loves us with a continual love, an everlasting love. This is part of the blessing of Revelation, to know of his great love for us. This love is poured out on all who have been washed of their sins in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. This is not a universal experience, but a unique washing by Christ of those who personally call on him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means there's no other way. All the religions of the world will fall. But Jesus Christ will stand forever. All the ways of of social philosophy, of Eastern mysticism, all the ways of Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and what other isms you want will fall because there is one way to be saved and that is through Jesus Christ. And we must personally call on Him. The Bible tells us the blood of Jesus, God's Son, purifies us from all sin. And that's the only thing that does it. Jesus is worthy of praise because he not only cleanses us from sin when we believe, but he also makes us what God has always wanted us to be. He forms us into his image, into that Jesus-shaped life that brings honor and glory to God. By his grace through faith, we are enabled to enter into this royal priesthood, giving us access to the Holy of Holies. We don't need a mediator between God and man. We have one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ. The veil was torn when Jesus died on the cross. And the Holy of Holies is open to us. We are enabled to enter into the very presence of Almighty God. Therefore, we can go before the throne of grace, not as one condemned, but as a child, his own dear child. This, my brothers and sisters, should bring us great comfort to know that we can take all of our worries, all our troubles, and all of our joys before our Heavenly Father and know that He will meet our needs according to His holy will. Take it all to Him. Don't hold on to it. Don't sit and stew. Take it all to Him. And He'll meet our needs according to His will. This same Jesus who has made it possible for us to come into the presence of the Father, it says, will come with the clouds of heaven. And everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. All the nations of the world will mourn for him. Why are they mourning? Here we have a word of encouragement for the church. It is an assurance of the promise of Acts 1.11 that someday, just as they saw him go, he will return. There will come a day when Christ returns to bring justice and judgment on the earth. Our text says that his return will bring mourning from all those who have not experienced salvation in his name. Why? Because in this age, everyone, every single person has the privilege of obtaining salvation in his name. But when he returns, there will be no more chances for those who do not believe. We have to accept Him in this life. We have to be ready for His return in season and out of season, as the Apostle Paul says, by committing ourselves to Him. Because there will come a day when there will not be another chance. For some of us, it'll be that moment that we die and we draw our last breath. For others, it will be when the last trumpet blast sounds and the dead in Christ rise and the believers rise to meet Him in the air. Then those who remain on the earth are going to have a big problem because the time will be up. There's no more chances. The revelation of Jesus Christ calls the church to hang in there, to not give up to not stop being a witness for Jesus because God will see us through to the end. 
Revelation also reminds us that there are many in our world who are lost and the time is fast approaching when the last chance for repentance will come. Therefore, we like John are called to share the message of Christ with all those who are lost in the darkness of sin. All those who are oppressed by the world and without hope, we need to share the love of Jesus with them. For in His love, the one who is, who always was and is still to come, desires to know them. And regardless of how and when Jesus comes back, we are left with a mission that constitutes our daily purpose and consumes our daily energies to side with God's activity in the world of the kingdom, reaching out to those desperate, desolate, and deserted with the hope of Christ. Let each of us, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, take comfort in the hope we have in Christ and share that hope with the world around us that we may, that all may know that we have a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This is a battle cry. This is a gift of hope. This is the joy of knowing eternal life in Him. And it is the message that we are called to bring into the world But we serve one master, and his name is Jesus Christ. Earthly kingdoms will fall, but Jesus Christ will reign forever. Amen? Amen. Let us join today in our response to the word. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things. Father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the Savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in the grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as the sufficient rule for both faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, touch each heart gathered here today and those who are listening, that each of us will know that we do indeed have salvation in your name. Lord, we know that we do not always fully and completely give ourselves over to you. And we repent and are heartily sorry for the misdoings that we have in our lives. We ask for your forgiveness. And we ask for the anointing of your Holy Spirit that we might share this good news with those who are in desperate need of hearing. Lord, today, make us instruments of your peace in this world that many more might come to know you and the joy of your salvation. For it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I'm a God.